So I'm going to talk today about uh, machine learning at Uber. Um, and there's sort of three phases of the talk. The first one is to go over um, some of the interesting sort of use cases of, of ML at Uber. Um, second piece is around uh, looking at the sort of first version of the platform that we built to support those use cases many more. And then uh, the final section is, is kind of more tailored to this, uh, this track, which is around um, kind of developer experience and how we're working right now to um, kind of accelerate machine learning um, uh, usage and adoption and, 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 and innovation at Uber um, through better tooling and, and, and better experience end-to-end. Um, -end. All right, so first thing, ML at Uber. Um, uh, Uber, I think, is one of the most exciting places right now to do machine learning for a bunch of reasons. Um, you know, first is that uh, you know, there's not sort of one or two big use cases that consume all of the ML attention horsepower. Um, uh, there's a wide, a wide array of, of, uh, of projects of more equal weight uh, across the whole company. And, and we'll go through a bunch of those. Um, uh, second one is uh, the um, sort of interestingness of the data. Like Uber is, you know, Uber operates in the physical world. All the, the rider partner and, and driver apps, um, uh, you know, have GPSs. They have accelerometers. Um, and we collect a lot of interesting data about the physical world. And of course, the cars, you know, move around the physical world. And so... Um, we're not just dealing with people clicking on web pages. We're dealing with, with things out there in the world. Um, the third thing is, you know, Uber is a young, younger company. And so in a lot of cases, uh, you know, we're applying machine learning in areas for the very first time. And so you're not trying to, you know, um, uh, uh, grind out a few extra fractions of a percent of accuracy. You're actually seeing, you know, giant swings of the first time you get a, a new model deployed into production for some use case. Um, and the final one is that ML is really central and strategic to Uber at this point. Um, you know, the, the decisions and features that we can, um, we can base on the data that we collect, um, you know, very, very hard to copy. Um, and then also, you know, ML is, is one of the things that helps Uber um, kind of run the whole machine uh, more efficiently. Um, it's, it's applied lots of places to, to make the product and a lot of the internal operations um, run much more, much more efficiently. All right, so data at Uber, you know, data is, I mean, Uber has grown a lot in the last, um, Bunch of years, uh, we have 75 million riders now, three million drivers, um, completed four billion trips um, uh, last year, and so it's even bigger this year. Um, we operate in 600 cities, and we're completing you know more than a million, 15 million trips um, every single day. Um, and to give you a sense, again, this is several years ago, so things have grown a lot since then. But this is sort of GPS traces of uh, the driver phones um, in London over the course of, I think, six hours. But you can see how you know, the cars very quickly cover a lot of the city. Um, and this is all data that we can use for, for machine learning. Um, and so this is, you know, there's, I think, over 100 um, sort of ML uh, use cases or problems being solved at Uber right now. So this is a, a small sampling of ones. Um, but you can see it really cuts across the whole company from Uber Eats, and we'll, and we'll talk about that one in, in more depth. Um, to self-driving cars, to customer support, um, pricing, uh, forecasting, and then even things um, kind of more removed from the product, um, like doing anomaly detection on, on system metrics and, and, and uh, you know, on the back-end services, and then even like capacity planning our data centers to make sure we have you know, adequate hardware capacity for both the long-term as well as, as shorter-term spikes that we get on, on big holidays like New Year's Eve and, 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 and Halloween. So here I'll kind of walk through a few interesting ones. So Uber Eats, every time you open the Uber Eats app, we score, um, I think, hundreds of different models to generate the homepage for you. Um, so uh, we use models to try to figure out which restaurants you're most likely interested in ordering from. And so we do ranking of restaurants. Within some of the screens, there's actually uh, meals. And so we rank the meals, again, uh, trying to see which ones you're more likely to want. All of the uh, delivery times that you can see below the, below the uh, restaurant um, our ML models trying to predict you know, how long will it take once you place the order for the order to get prepared, for them to notify the driver partner, to drive to the restaurant, to get out of the car and walk into the restaurant, to pick up the meal, walk back to the car, and then drive it to your house. And so ML is used um, you know, to, to model that whole problem and give you know, pretty good um, ETAs for delivery time for, um, for the meals. And then finally, search ranking. When you try to search for a meal, it will, again, not just do prefix-based searching, but also try to predict um, your intent and, and what you're looking for. And this is, you know, this is uh, you know, an A-B test. This, this makes a big difference for Uber's business. Um, Self-driving cars, uh, you, know, um, you know, the cars have to use, you know, they have LiDAR and cameras that try to understand the world around them. Um, and they also, uh, so they used uh, ML for, for that, for object detection, um, tr trying to find where the streets go, looking out for pedestrians of the cars. And then also um, other parts in the process for, for planning um, and route finding and so forth. 
um, and the cars are, are mostly deep learning these days. Um, ETAs, um, so ETAs are the, you know, in the app when you request a ride or are um, about to request a ride, it tells you how far away the driver is. Um, and this is uh, super important both for the product experience for our users because, you know, if the ETA is incorrect, it's, it's quite frustrating and it may sort of um, affect how you use it. But it's also fed into um, lots and lots of other internal systems that drives pricing and routing and a bunch of other things. And so having accurate ETAs is super, super important to Uber. And, and it's, a, it's a hard problem. Um, and so Uber, for a long time, has had a route-based uh, um, you know, uh, ETA predictor that will look at the segments of the road you're going to travel over and you know, average, uh, you know, travel, you know, average uh, speeds over the, over in, in the past. And it will use that to predict kind of a base ETA. Uh, but what we found is those ETAs are, are, are usually you know, wrong to some degree, but they're wrong in, in consistent ways or, or predictable ways. And so we can fit models to the error and then use the prediction to correct the error and, and give um, you know, dramatically more accurate ETAs across the board. Um, map making, you know, Uber you know, used to use Google Maps, and now we're building out our own mapping infrastructure. And as part of the map making process, there's sort of a, a, a layering of evidence collection. You start with a, a base um, uh, you know, street um, map, and then you layer on evidence to make it more and more accurate. And so one of the things we do is we drive cars around with cameras on top and take pictures of all of the buildings and street signs. And then use and, and also tag those with the GPS coordinates of where the picture was taken from, and then use ML models to um, to try to find uh, um, you know addresses and street signs such that we can uh, um, you know add them to the database and help to um, you know make the overall the, the the map itself more accurate and consistent. So you get you get, you get sort of a, a base map and you layer on evidence that we collect you know with sensors and cars and machine learning to um, to actually find first first we figure out the um, the objects we're, we're interested in, and so in this case, you can see you know, street signs and addresses, and then we apply um, uh, text extraction algorithms to actually pull the text out of the image, and then, and then the actual text, whether it's an address or a street sign or a you know, restaurant name, can be fed into the database. Um, destination prediction, when you open the app and you are starting to search for where you want to go, um, ML, again, is used, um, you know, like in the Eats case, to try to help, you know, help, help, you, you know, help, help you find the place you want to go. Um, on, in forecasting and marketplace, um, you know, Uber is a marketplace. We try to connect riders and drivers um, for rides. And it's, you know, for the thing to work, it's very important that the riders and drivers you know, be close to each other in both space and time. If you request a ride and the driver is very, very far away across the city, it doesn't work because it takes too long to drive across the city to get to you. Um, if you request a ride and there's no drivers available, um, even ones that are close, it doesn't work either. And so the, the sort of proximity and space and time of supply and demand is quite important. Um, and you, you can sort of contrast that with a business like eBay, which is also a marketplace, but you can, you, know, you can order a futon today from LA and they can ship it next week. And, and that all works out, even though the distance and time are spread out. But for Uber, the, the, the sort of spatial temporal thing is quite important. And so, um, uh, and Uber's maps, you can see the little hexagons there. We, we, we divide up the maps into hexagons. It's a more efficient way than, than a grid to, to organize maps. But we use deep learning models to predict a variety of, of marketplace metrics um, at various points of time in the future. Um, so, uh, you know, drivers who will be available, riders who will want rides, and then can um, identify, um, uh, um, you know, gaps between supply and demand in the future, and then use that to help um, uh, encourage drivers to go where there will be um, demand to help again keep ETAs low and, and, and utilization high. Um, Customer support, uh, you know, there are 15 million rides a day. People leave phones and backpacks in the back of cars and they file customer support tickets and those get routed to call centers and Uber spend lots and lots of money to, for people to answer support tickets. And what happens when a ticket comes in is the person has to read the ticket, figure out what the problem is, and then pick from a big menu of, of responses, um, you know, for the, prop, for the proper response for lost and found or whatever else. Um, we can use deep learning models um, uh, looking at the text of the message to try to predict what the actual problem was and then reduce the um, menu options from, I think, 30 down to three, like the three most likely response templates. And so you know, that gave, I think, a, initially a 10% boost, but I think we have another model which gave another 6% another boost in, in the speed at which um, these people can answer tickets, which is 16% you know, off of the cost of the, of the thing, which is huge for us. Um, and then actually another one that's quite similar, although different application, is uh, this, this new one-click chat thing that we released recently. And the idea here is that when, um, when, when a car is coming to pick you up, you often want to communicate with the driver to tell you know, her, her you know, exactly where you're standing or if you're you know, running down the block. 
um, but it's hard for drivers to, to type, um, and it's sort of easier to chat, and so we have a, um, an NLP model that basically predicts the likely response, um, the next response in a conversation, and so you can very quickly communicate with the driver um, and vice versa via just picking um, responses uh, out, out of a menu as opposed to typing. Um, and I, I forget the exact accuracy rate, but it's, but it's quite high, and you're able to carry on pretty good conversations without actually typing um, any text, which is pretty cool. All right, um, so that's, you know, that was like 10 or something out of you know, close to 100 different use cases around Uber where ML is being used. Um, and so over the last three years, we built a platform called Michelangelo, which supports um, you know, the majority of those use cases. Um, and so I'll talk a bit now about sort of the philosophy of the platform and, and sort of the first version and what it covers. So the you know, overall mission of my team is to you know, build software and tools that will enable data scientists and engineers around the company you know, to you know, kind of own the end-to-end, -to, -end to you know, deploy and operate uh, these ML solutions that we just saw before, um, and to do it sort of at, at full Uber scale. And there's a big sort of dev experience component to that because you want to empower um, the same person to own, you know, own the end-to-end -end, you know, from the, mod from the you know, idea and the prototyping the model all the way through deployment and production. You know, the, the more you can have one person own that process, um, you know, the, 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 the faster uh, um, you, you can move through it. And, and you know, modeling work being very iterative, um, you know, the faster you can move, move through things has a compounding effect because there are lots of cycles as you experiment with new models. Um, this is, we had a blog post recently. In, in addition to th technology, there's been a lot of kind of organizational and process um, aspects to ML Uber. Um, they've been quite important in, in making it work well um, at scale in terms of the, the system scale, but also the organizational scale. And there's a blog post we put out recently that, that describes a bunch of this. All right, so um, you know, V1 of, of ML at Uber was um, really just to enable people to do it. Um, and, and that's been quite successful and powerful, but it's, uh, you know, it wasn't always the easiest thing. And so as we look at um, you know, V2 is, is more around how do we improve developer um, productivity and, and experience and, and increase uh, sort of velocity of, of modeling work and deployment work, um, again, to facilitate um, kind of innovation. All right, so this is um, a walkthrough of the platform, um, sort of the first version of the platform, and then we'll talk about the things we're doing now to, to make it better and faster. So one of the early um, kind of hypotheses that we had or, 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 or a vision around the platform was that you know, machine learning is much more than just training models, um, that there's a whole end-to-end -end workflow that you have to support to make, it, to make it actually work well. And it starts with uh, managing data, and this you know, actually in most cases ends up being the most complicated part of the, of the process. Um, you have to manage the you know, data sets that you use for training the model, which is the, the features and the labels. Um, and and you know, it has to be accurate, and you have to be able to uh, manage it for training and retraining. And then when you deploy the model, you have to get that same data um, to the model in production. And at Uber, most models are deployed into um, you know, a real-time prediction service for request response-based predictions. And so in many times, you know, the data that you need for the model is sitting in a dupe somewhere. And so you have to wire up the pipelines for running kind of analytical queries against historical data and then delivering that into a key value store where the model can read it. And so a lot of kind of complicated pipelines um, for, for getting the right data delivered to the right time um, and place uh, for the model to use at its scoring time. Um, training models, obviously, you have to actually train the models. And that's, you know, we, we do a bunch there. Uh, model evaluation. Um, you, you, you know, modeling work is very iterative, and so you want to be able to have good tools for comparing models and finding out which ones are, are, are good or not. Um, deployment, you know, once you have a model that you like, you want to be able to click a button or call an API and have it deployed out across um, your serving infrastructure. And then uh, making predictions, that's the obvious part. And then, and then monitoring is interesting um, in that you, you, know, you, you train models against historical data, you evaluate against historical data, and then when you, are, when you deploy model in production, you then don't actually know if it's doing the right thing anymore because you're seeing new data against the model. And so being able to um, you know, monitor the accuracy of predictions going forward in time becomes quite important. And what we found is that the same workflow you know, applies across um, you know, all sorts of, or most of the, of the ML um, problems we've seen from traditional you know, trees and linear models to deep learning, um, you know, supervised and unsupervised, um, you know, online learning where you're learning more continuously. Um, you know, whether you're deploying a model in a, in a batch pipeline or online or on a mobile phone. And then even as we saw in that marketplace case, you know, it works for you know, classification regression, but also for time series forecasting. So for all these things, the same basic workflow holds true. Um, and so we spent time building out you know, platform to support, to support these things. All right, so managing data. I hit a bit of this before already, but 
Um, you know, most cases, data is the hardest part of ML. And um, we've built a variety of things, including a centralized feature store where teams can, can register and curate and share features that are used across different models. Um, and that, you know, that, that uh, uh, facilitates modeling work because rather than having to write new queries to find your features, you can just pick and choose them from a feature store. And then, you know, more import or as importantly, you know, once your model goes into production, we can automatically wire up the pipelines to deliver those features uh, to the model at prediction time. Uh, training models, uh, you know, we run large scale distributed uh, training for both uh, um, uh, on, on CPU clusters for trees and linear models, and then on, on GPU clusters for, um, for deep learning models. Um, in the case of deep learning, um, you know, we, we base a lot of it around uh, TensorFlow and, and, and PyTorch, but we built our own distributed training infrastructure called Horovod. I won't go into too much detail here, but and we'll actually come back to this in the dev experience section, but Horvat has two interesting aspects. One is that it makes distributed training um, more efficient by getting rid of the parameter server and, and using um, a different technique involving MPI and ring reduction to more efficiently um, uh, uh, you know, uh, shuffle data around during distributed training. But it also um, makes the, the APIs for managing the distributed training jobs are much, much easier for the modeling um, developers, and, and we'll come back to that later. So it's, it's quite strong in terms of, of scale and, and, and speed, but also much, much easier to use. Managing eval models, again, after you, you train models, um, you, know, you often train you know, tens, or hundreds of, tens or hundreds of models before you find one that's, that's sort of good enough for your use case. And so being able to keep a rigorous uh, um, recording of all the models you train, the training data, who trained them, as well as a lot of uh, metrics and reports around um, you know, accuracy of the model and even debug reports helps the modelers um, you know, iterate and eventually find the model that they, that they want to use in production. And so we invest a lot of work here in, in, in sort of you know, collecting metadata about the models and then, and then exposing it in, in ways that are very easy for developers to make sense of and, and move the modeling process forward. And so we have, um, this is for a, um, for a, uh, um, a regression model, and so there's the standard kind of error metrics as well as reporting to show um, you know, kind of the accuracy of the model, um, sort of very standard things that data scientists are, are used to doing. Um, for a classification model, again, different set of metrics, but again, the things that, that people need to use to hone in on, on the best model for their, for their use case. Um, and then you know, for all of the different features that go into the model, we look at the importance of the feature to the model as well as um, statistics about that data. So the, you know, the, the mean, the min, the max, standard deviation, as well as distribution. Um, again, all things that help you understand um, the data in the model um, and, and accelerate the, the work here. And this is a, uh, for, for tree models, we expose a, a tool that lets you actually dig into the structure of the learned trees um, to help understand you know, how the model works and, and, and to help explain you know, why a certain um, set of, of input features generates a certain prediction. And so um, you know, across the top, you can see, so this is a boosted tree with, a, you know, can't, each, each column in that top grid is, a, is one tree in the forest. Um, each row is a feature. Um, and then as you click on a tree, you'll see the tree at the bottom with, the, with the, all the split points and distributions. And then you can actually um, fill in data on the left there and it will, sh it will light up the path through the tree so you can see how the tree handles that, that feature vector. So again, if a model's not behaving correctly, you can pull up the screen and figure out exactly why the model generating, is generating a certain prediction for a certain um, input set of, of, of features. And then deployment and serving. So once you've, um, once you've you know, found the model that you want, it's important to be able to deploy it. Um, Uber does both uh, batch predictions, meaning you, you run a job once a day or once an hour to generate lots and lots of predictions, or you can deploy a model um, into a, uh, essentially a web service, so a container that will receive um, you know, network requests and then return predictions. And, and you know, most models at Uber and, and a lot of the ones that I showed before um, are all of that nature. So you open your, your Uber Eats app and it calls the backend services and it will score a bunch of models to render, to render your homepage um, you know, in whatever it is, 100 milliseconds. Um, and so we have built and, and operate uh, the prediction clusters that scale out um, and, and are used uh, across the company. Um, and kind of a quick architectural diagram, but the idea is from the, the client sends the, the feature vector in, that we have a kind of routing infrastructure and then within the model, or sorry, within the prediction service, you can have multiple models um, loaded, and so based on a, on a header, it will go find the right model, um, send the feature vector to that model, get the prediction back, 
in some cases, load more data from Cassandra, which is the feature store we talked about, um, and then return the prediction back to the client. And I think right now we're running close to a million predictions a second across all the different use cases um, at Uber, which is quite a bit. All right. Um, so yeah, so the yeah we're at one million plus, and then um, you know in for for trees and linear models the the scoring time is quite fast. Um, I think typically we're we're less than five milliseconds for P95. I think it is for if, if there's no um, if no, if there's no Cassandra in the path for the for the online features, and then when you have to call Cassandra to get features, it adds another you know five or ten or twenty milliseconds. So um, all in all, still quite fast for predictions, which is good. We're starting to work on uh, more deep learning models, and those are trickier because depending on the complexity of the model, the inference time can actually go up quite a bit. Um, but for trees, it's, 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 it's usually very, very fast. Um, and the final bit I talked about is you've you know, trained against historical data, and now you deploy your model in production, and you want to make sure that it's, you know, when you evaluate it against historical data, you know your model was good for last week's data, but now it's running in production, and you want to make sure it's actually good for, you know, for the data that you're seeing right now. And um, uh, so we can do, and, and we'll come back to this at the end. There's another uh, kind of newer piece of this, but there's a few different ways you can, you know, monitor uh, your predictions. Um, the the ideal way is where you can actually log the predictions that you make, and then join them back to um, the uh, outcomes that you observe um, as part of the running of the system um, later on, and then see how you know see whether you got the the, the prediction right or wrong. And so you can imagine, you know, for the Uber Eats case, we predict the ETA for a certain restaurant, and then you order the meal, and then 20 minutes later it delivers, and then we know the actual um, arrival time from that meal, and that's collected in one of our backend systems. And if we log the prediction that we made for your, um, when, when you viewed the screen, and then join that back to the actual delivery time, we can see you know, how right or wrong that prediction was, and you collect those in aggregate, and then you can generate um, very accurate, um, you know, ongoing accuracy reports um, for your model in production. And uh, this one, you know, because you have to wait for batch processes to run to collect the outcomes, you can get good monitoring, but there's, a, I think, an hour delay before you can you know, know, know you know, how, how correct the prediction was. So then from an architecture perspective, you know, again, walking through you know, along the top, you have the, the different um, workflow steps. And then at the bottom, you have both our offline um, batch systems at the bottom and then our online systems at the top. Um, and we'll kind of just kind of walk through the stages of, of the architecture. Um, and so in the offline world, we start in the lower left with our data lake. And so all of Uber's data funnels into Hadoop, you know, Hadoop and Hive tables. And that's the starting point for most, um, you know, most, most batch data, data work. Um, it was part of the ML platform. We let developers write either Spark or, um, or SQL jobs to, to do the kind of the coarse grain, you know, joining and aggregation and collection of feature data um, and outcome data. And then those are, are, are fed back into to Hive tables that are used for, for training and batch prediction. And then in cases uh, where you want those features available online for prediction time, um, th those, those values that were calculated in those, those um, batch jobs can be copied into Cassandra for online serving. And so for example, um, in the Uber Eats uh, delivery time case, you know, one of the features is something like, you know, what's the average meal prep time for a restaurant over the last two weeks? And, um, and so that's computed via you know, a Spark job. And because it's a two week average, it's kind of okay if, if that only gets refreshed in Cassandra once or twice a day, because two weeks plus or minus 12 hours doesn't make that much difference for that kind of metric. And so that's, that one is fine flowing through the bottom batch path. It gets computed once a day, loaded to Cassandra, and then we can use that same value to, um, for, each, for every single prediction. Um, however, there are cases where you want you know, more, you want the features to be a lot fresher. And so, in addition to the two-week meal prep time for a restaurant, you may also want to know, you know, which gives you a sense of how, you know, just how fast the restaurant is in general. You may also want to know, um, you know, how busy is the restaurant right now? So what was the, what's the meal prep time over the last, you know, one hour or last five minutes? And obviously, if you're computing things with that freshness, you can't afford to go run, you know, offline jobs. And so we have a streaming path across the top where we can get metrics coming out of Kafka. We can run, you know, Flink job to aggregate across the stream of data and then um, write uh, those numbers into Cassandra and then double write them back to Hive so you have the exact same numbers available later on for training. And so sort of the parity between online and offline is super important to get right. Um, and the way we've solved that generally is by having like only compute the, the, the um, only compute the feature once and then double write it to um, the, the other store. Uh, so then batch training, um, 
you know, pulls data from uh, these you know, hive tables and runs it through the algorithm, which could be a tree or a linear model or a deep learning model, and then writes the output, uh, it's actually not Cassandra anymore, but into a model database that stores you know, all of the metadata about the model um, you know, that we talked about before, who trained it, when it was trained, what data set, and then as well as all of the actual um, uh, you know, learn parameters, the artifacts of the model. And so if it's a, a tree model, it's the, all the split points we saw before. If it's a deep learning model, it's all of the, the learn weights um, in the network. Um, and so we capture both the, you know, all the metadata, all the configuration, plus the actual uh, parameters of the model and store that in database. And then at, de at, at deployment time, um, you can click a button or through an API, uh, uh, you know, take one of those models you've trained and, and push that out into an either an online serving container that we talked about before that will do network-based you know, request response predictions, um, or you can deploy it into a, um, a batch job that will run you know, on a cadence and generate you know, lots and lots of predictions and, and then send them somewhere else. Um, and then finally, if you look at how the predictions actually happen, so along the top, you know, again, the, the, the real-time case, imagine you open the Uber Eats app and you wanna see your, your meal um, delivery time estimates. Um, you'll send, you know, the features coming from the phone would be, you know, your location, time of day, a bunch of things that are relevant to the current context. And that will go to the model. And then, um, you know, the model as part of its configuration knows that in addition to the features that come as part of the current request, we have to get a bunch of other ones that are waiting for it in the feature store. And so we have the, um, you know, the one or the one hour meal prep time and the two week meal prep time and probably a bunch of others are pulled out of Cassandra and then joined to the features you sent um, from the phone. And then that whole feature vector is then sent to the model for, for scoring. And so you can see we're kind of blending the, the, the request context features with a bunch that are computed either via streaming jobs or via batch jobs. Um, and again, like a lot of the, the challenges here are, are getting the system set up and, 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 and in a way that where it's very easy for developers to wire up all these pipelines and not have to do it um, one off each time. Because that's where, you know, without this, that's where most of the work in an ML goes is getting these data pipelines set up. And then for the uh, monitoring case, um, either for uh, real time or batch predictions, we can you know, log the predictions back um, to Hadoop and then join them to the outcomes you know, once we learn about them as part of the regular processing of, of data. And then we can you know, push those out to metric systems for, for alerting and, 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 and monitoring. Um, and again, because these are batch jobs, you know, I think it's, we run these things once an hour, so it's not super real time um, yet, but, uh, but we'll come back to that later. And then zooming out, uh, we have a sort of a management plane um, that we use for um, you know, the monitoring. We pumped this to central monitoring system that, that, that drive dashboards. We have an API tier that uh, kind of orchestrates and sort of the brains of the system. And then it also um, is a uh, kind of public API surface for the web UI that's used to doing a lot of the, the workflow management and deployment. And then uh, you can write uh, you know, Python or Java you know, automation code or integration code to, to drive the system from the outside. I have a quick little video here showing the UI, but um, you know it's it's organized around projects, and these are all kind of dummy names. But um, a project is a container for modeling problem. You can go connect to you know Hive table um, to train your model on. Um, you can let's see here go you know look at all of the models you've trained. Um, we talked about this before. Um, so it's a bunch of boosted tree models. You can drill into one of these. Oops, I click something. Um, oops, let me try that again. So projects. Go grab a hive table. Um, and then drill in, I think we're gonna drill in and see some of the visualizations and reports on one of these models. So this one's already deployed. We can click in. You can see that this is a classification model. So you can see the, the confusion matrix and a bunch of the different metrics used to assess accuracy. This is the, the tree thing we saw before that has, um, uh, you know, this, this model has whatever, 162 features and a lot of trees. And you can see the actual, you know, split points in the, in, in the trees. And then here's the feature report for all the features in this model with uh, the distributions and so forth. And I think we're going to go deploy a model here. You can see how fast it goes out. So you click, so this model, it's not deployed. You click deploy, click 
click OK, and it spins for a few minutes and sort of packages up the model and pushes it out to the serving infrastructure, and then boom, it's ready to go. And then here you can see the, you know, the history of all the different models you've deployed over time, um, you know, sort of logs of, of who deployed and when. Cool. All right, so that's the, you know, that's sort of the V1 of the platform, and, and this is what's, you know, we built over the last few years to, um, you know, to support ML use cases at scale. Um, you know, it, it's worked well. In some cases, you know, things weren't as fast, as easy as they could be, and, and so the next wave of, of our efforts on the platform around how do you, um, how do you take this foundation that we have now and how do you make it sort of faster and easier for people to go from idea um, through prototyping to first model and then deploy that and then sort of scale that model up, up into production. And we'll go through a few recent projects that we've um, either finished building or, or are building right now to address those problems. So on the right side, um, you know, are, are sort of working now on, 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 on accelerating ML. And so we have a new Python ML project that helps um, people work with um, kind of bringing the, the tool set to the, to, to the data scientists who, who prefer working in Python over, over web UIs or over, over Scala. Um, Horovod is our distributed deep learning system that has a really elegant API. Um, Autotune is our first uh, piece of, of AutoML, so allowing the system to help you train good models as opposed to having the data scientist or engineer kind of have to figure out all the right settings themselves. And some new visualization tools to help understand you know, why models are working well or not. And then some newer features around uh, um, understanding more in real time how the model's behaving in production. The, the thing I showed you earlier was you know, refresh once an hour, and now we have more real time um, uh, uh, monitoring of, of the model in production. All right, so um, as we've you know, started to look at how do we make, uh, how do we accelerate model development and, and sort of address the developer experience problem um, with machine learning, we've kind of uh, looked at a few things. One is, you know, ML is this long workflow from getting data to training models all the way through, and, and you know, there's friction points in every single step, and so we've been quite, you know, rigorous around trying to identify where those friction points are and, and kind of grinding off the rough edges and making the workflow faster. Um, one of the guiding uh, kind of principles or philosophies has been that, and this kind of goes back in many ways to the, you know, DevOps philosophy, where if you let the engineer own, you know, own the code from um, from prototype through hardening, through through QA, through production, you can accelerate the loop of of trying something out, getting in production, and you also build better systems because the engineers are are on the hook to support the thing in production. And we found the same thing applies to machine learning too. If you can empower the data scientists to own you know, more and more of the workflow, ideally the whole thing, um, that they're able to, you know, to traverse the workflow faster and they also have more ownership of the, of the problem end to end. Um, you know, bringing the tools to developers, we made a few mistakes early on around, um, you know, not, not embracing the tools that the data scientists um, were already very familiar with, i.e. Python. Um, so we're bringing that back. Um, and then more investments in, in sort of visual tools to help um, understand and debug uh, models. All right, so PyML. The general problem here is that uh, you know Michelangelo initially targeted their super high scale use cases, so high scale training on giant data sets and, and high scale um, predictions, um, you know, at very low latency, and that was great for you know the first couple years of use cases and a lot of the, the highest value ones. Um, however, we found that um, the system is not as easy to use and not as flexible. Um, as is desired by many data scientists and also as is required by sort of a long tail of, uh, of more unique problems across Uber. And so the solution was, you know, how can we um, just support sort of plain Python and the rich ecosystem of Python tools um, throughout this end-to-end -end workflow and do it um, you know, at, at somewhat limited scale because you're, you're dealing with Python, you're dealing with a non-distributed environment, but, but make it scale and make it work as well as we possibly can. And so the basic idea is to allow people to build models in you know, using you know, essentially any, any Python code and any Python libraries, um, uh, you know, implement a you know, serving interface in Python, and then um, have sort of packaging and deployment tools that will treat it like any other model that we have and, and be able to push it out to our serving infrastructure. And I'll go through a quick thing, um, but sort of the trade-offs between uh, the, the PyML and the other system is really kind of a trade between flexibility and sort of resource efficiency and scale and, and latency. But the general idea is that, and this is a pretty simple, I think this is a Kaggle case, but um, we're gonna build a, I think a logistic regression model, is that right? Um, but we're gonna build a pandas data frame. Yeah, we train a logistic regression model um, and, then, and then run some test predictions at the very bottom. And so very simple, you know, kind of standard um, scikit-learn model. 
and this is, this is actually all happening in a, in a Jupyter notebook. I didn't show the whole context, but this is all happening in Jupyter. So you can you know, have a requirements file that, that selects all of your dependencies. You can then import your Python libraries. Um, you, uh, um, you know, then pick, you save the model file back out to your directory. Um, and then you can, um, this is the serving interface. You implement the interface that knows how to load that model um, back into the file and then implements a predict method that can do you know, simple feature transformations and then feed the data through the model for scoring. And so you can kind of see how these pieces you know, you know, give you an interface to score the model. And then through the API, we can you know, test the model. And then at the bottom, we can actually um, call upload model. And this will package up the model and all its dependencies and send it up to you know, the Michelangelo backend such that it can be managed in our UI and then deployed um, the same way other models can be deployed. And so this model has been uploaded, so now you can see it in the UI the same way you saw the other models that were all trained on the high scale system. And then either through the UI or through the API, you can then deploy the model um, out to the exact same sort of infrastructure to do you know, real time requ request response scoring. And we also, I don't have an example here, but you can also deploy it out to a Spark job to do batch, batch scoring. Um, but again, so this is an attempt to you know, embrace the flexibility of Python and, and the tools that data scientists like to use already and then provide the infrastructure and scaffolding to kind of make it work at, at the sort of highest scale that these tools um, you know, can support. Architecturally, um, uh, you know, on the left side there is the, you know, in your environment where you're working, whether it's Jupyter or any other Python environment, you basically, you know, train your model, save it locally, you know, using whatever techniques you want. You build your, your model.py file, which is that one that had the serving, the predict interface in it. Um, and then you have your typical requirements and packages that tell the system um, for all of the libraries and, and, and system um, libraries that you need. And then there is a, um, you know, basically a packaging and build step that builds up a Docker container um, that includes your, your model and all the dependencies. And that can be pushed out, um, I would cut off the screen there. It can be pushed out to our online serving system on the top or to um, our, sorry, offline on the top or our online system on the bottom for doing either batch predictions via Spark job or online predictions via um, the request response thing that we saw before. And looking a little more closer, so on the left is the, is the uh, online serving of the high scale models, which is you know, the picture we saw before. Um, and on the left side, you can see that we, we actually deploy a nested Docker container containing all of the Python resources. And so our existing prediction service acts as a sort of proxy or gateway and then routes to a local um, Docker container that contains all the Python code. Um, so you get all of the same monitoring and, and um, support of the, um, and sort of the, the, the network stuff of our high scale prediction container, but then we can route the request to um, the, the nested Python service um, that, that's used for the actual scoring. And then you can use scikit-learn, you can use deep learning, you can write custom algorithms, and this is super flexible. Now the trade-offs are you'll, you'll have slightly higher latency, it's, it doesn't scale as cheaply because Python's running, and then you know, if you're using scikit-learn, you can't train on giant data sets because it's not distributed. Um, but in terms of, of developer friendliness and speed, um, it's great, and I think the, the way people are approaching it is they can use this as, to very quickly get out a model, you know, say for one city, um, and then once they've proved that the model matters, then, they're, then they're, it's sort of a, a, an easier sell to go rebuild it on the high scale system. So Horovod is our deep learning, um, distributed deep learning system, and it has, as we mentioned before, kind of two interesting facets. Um, you know, one is that it scales more efficiently than the other distributed deep learning approaches, um, but it also, the API for it is much, much simpler and much easier to set up, your, much easier to go from a, a single node training job to a distributed training job. And so in this case, um, we pulled an example from, I think it's from the TensorFlow documentation for how to set up a, a distributed training job in TensorFlow using a parameter server. And you can see, um, you know, there's basically one, there's one little method in the middle there which is training the model and everything else is, is setting up the distributed training environment, which is sort of not stuff that, that, a, that a modeler should have to care about. In the Horovod case, um, we're able to do you know, uh, sort of better distributed training with a lot less work. And so we have the, the train method um, up there in the middle and then um, around it are a few um, you know, API calls to set up um, you know, Horovod to do the training. There's a initialization um, and then a few other calls to, to set up the environment. But sort of much, much easier and friendlier than, than some of the other approaches. And this has been sort of quite popular in the community as well for, for both those reasons. Uh, manifold, um, 
So one of the challenges, you know, in, in the VIS reports we showed before is you tend to, you know, in train models, you tend to get a global accuracy metric. And so, you know, what's the AUC or mean squared error for the whole model across the whole data set? And that's, you know, a good starting point, but often different segments of the data will have very different um, uh, characteristics and, and, and the model will treat them very, very differently. And we've had cases, where, we've seen cases where, you know, a model on the whole works great, but then there's, you know, one slice of data where, where it behaves very, very poorly and it may be a very important slice of data. And so Manifold, we're building visualization tools that let you um, kind of dive in more to the data and understand, you know, how a model works on, on smaller pieces, or on, on smaller seg segments of that data and trying to um, help you identify ones where, you know, they're anomalous or, 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 or look different or problematic. Um, so Autotune, this is a system, um, you know, once you have the, you know, once you've figured out the features for your model, there's often a lot of work to figure out the right combination of, of hyperparameters um, that gives you the, the best accuracy. And so for a tree model, you have the number of trees, you have um, the depth of the forest, or sorry, the number of trees, the depth of the trees, um, you have binning, there's you know, probably six or 10 different uh, hyperparameters that you can tweak. And it's impossible to know upfront what the right combination is. And so it's often a sort of brute force process of finding um, the right combination of those. And, and you know, a, a common approach is either a brute force grid search where you just generate a essentially a hypercube of all the different options and try every one. You can do a random search where you do the same thing, but then just search random pieces and find a pretty good one. Um, or you can use what's called black box optimization and you can actually um, more efficiently uh, and experimentally, um, you know, try, um, try different combinations and, and learn the sort of shape of the, of the space and then traverse more directly to a more optimal, um, a more optimal uh, a set of, of parameters. Um, and so we, we collaborated with the uh, research team at Uber to, to build this. Um, and as you can see on the right, um, the, the, um, the, the, the line in the bottom is the, uh, is the, the Bayesian uh, black box optimized uh, hyperparam search, which, which gets to a, a better model in much fewer iterations than a, than a grid search does, because it can do it, it can, you know, sort of learns the process and can do it much more efficiently. And so again, this is kind of getting into AutoML. How do you how do you help developers you know build models faster in a more automated fashion and, and save um, you know sort of you know deploy the human intelligence where it's really needed, not where it can be you know automated away. And then the final one is around you know a big part of you know once you have the model you like and you deploy it, a big part of the thing is is how do you make sure that model is behaving correctly in production? And we we talked about being able to join you know predictions back to to outcomes to to know your model is behaving well. Um, there's a couple problems with that. One is, um, you know, it, it, we, we run that as a batch job, and so there's a delay. You know, in the case of credit card fraud, it can take, you know, 90 days for the bank to send you the outcomes, and so you, you, you often can't sort of join to the outcomes as quickly as you'd want to. And so the other approach is to, um, it's less, uh, less accurate in a sense, less precise, but, it, but it's much, much quicker, and that is just kind of looking at distributions of, of both feature data, so the input data, as well as the predictions coming out over time. And, you know, for most models, um, you know, the, the, there should be a pretty regular distribution of features and, and predictions over time. Um, and then maybe there's a seasonality to it as, as the day and the week flows by, but it's often easy to sort of identify, you know, big anomalies that, that often cause problems. And, and usually, the result, usually they're caused by um, bad data coming in, either from a broken service or a broken pipeline. Um, and so you can see in this case we have um, this is a classification model. So the top, we're just looking at the distribution of um, true versus false, which you can see the distribution is pretty steady over time. Um, and then we have a few other slices looking at um, the actual uh, class probability over time, and then a few sort of histograms cast as time series, so you can see you know how the how the bucketing of of data works over time. And I think these ones are all you know things kind of look okay. Um, and in this case, we're now looking at uh, at the top. Um, the prediction result, but then also looking against the distribution of features in the model. And you can see at the top, we actually had a, you know, the predictions themselves kind of deviated from what looks more normal. And at the bottom, um, you can see it was actually a feature that had some, some bad data that was sort of triggering the, the abnormal predictions. And so, um, again, so like, like with software engineering, you know, we're running a production system, having all the monitoring set up automatically for you is super important. And, and you know, for ML, that matters, uh, you know, at the system level, but it also matters at the data and the model level. You want to make sure that not only is the system not erring out, but that the predictions and data are, are correct and that there aren't breakages in data pipelines, um, which, is, which is a sort of common failure mode for, for ML models. 
All right, so key lessons learned recently. Um, you know, one I mentioned before, you know, around sort of productivity in ML is, is bringing the tools to developers. You know, we, again, focused very early on on high scale, and, and you know, that was the right first choice for Uber, but, but now as we focus on, on, on velocity, we're now bringing the tools closer to developers and even, even compromising on scale to make that um, easier and faster, and then providing a path to scale up you know, as, the, as the problem is more deeply understood. Um, you know, data is generally the hardest part of ML, and so having really good infrastructure and tooling and, and automation around the, the data management um, lets the modelers focus on the modeling problem and not on, on the plumbing. Um, you know, on, on, the, on the system developer side, you know, we, we've leveraged a lot of open source, um, but, and, and, and we've, we've you know, struggled in many cases to make it, like it's, it's taken a lot longer in many cases to make things actually work well at scale. Um, nothing's free. Um, um, and the last one is that uh, you know, real-time ML is, 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 is quite challenging and, and hard to get right and, and hard to empower modelers to own the end-to-end, -end. And, and, and we're investing a lot at Uber to, uh, to make those systems kind of run themselves so developers can focus on, on the modeling work and not worry about um, the systems themselves. All right, thank you.